slides. Good afternoon. Yeah, I, I do um, have another speech to give tomorrow, which is probably a little bit more important than this one. <laughs> um, I like to think of it as not so much losing a, da a daughter as kind of uh, gaining a bedroom. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Those of you who But uh, anyway, that's that. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm going to be talking about a variety. I'm going to throw a lot of stuff at you, and hopefully in the short time we've got. Start with the technologies. Um, what happens in an internet minute? What, what happens in 60 seconds if you turn your computer off? What would you miss? Some of the stuff up here is quite phenomenal. Bearing in mind that this may be out of date now. Something like um, 100 plus new LinkedIn accounts being made. 1,300 new mobile users. One piece of information that you won't see up there is that only one paper-based article is published every minute somewhere in the world. And that's quite, quite remarkable. But as Ray Kurzweil says, um, Change isn't linear, it's actually exponential, so we can expect that to, to increase rapidly, as, as Steve showed earlier on with the Garner Hype um, cycle. So, um, but all of that really is digital graffiti. A lot of it is just content that's being chucked out there, and in, in effect, it's people tagging their, their, their uh, ideas and their identities, it's, it's people marking their space. Uh, so a lot of it is, is fairly useless to education, but there are obviously some gems in there that we'll find. Um, there is this idea of social tagging, the idea that you can actually find content and, and aggregate it and curate it, but then find other people who are also interested in that content. And I think that's a really important um, idea. So Delicious is one of those tools. Digo is another one, which I was talking to some people about earlier on. These tools are out there for us to use. Um, and, and really, the, that kind of technology is going to bring people together, I think, in, in many ways. Um, the idea that... These are folksonomies. These are kind of emergent properties that we see happening, coalescing on the web because of the communities that are using these tools and using these technologies and finding the content. Folksonomy, for me, actually defines the community. It's not about the community defining it. It defines the community. And this is a debatable point which we can come back to if you wish. Um, but then the idea of disruptive technology, the idea that the technology that we use can forever, irrevocably change what we do as educators and as uh, people who are just living in the world. Um, the idea that we never ever go back once we've gone forward because that technology has changed everything. So here's a few ideas for you. Gutenberg, that was a disruptive technology. Um, it was disruptive in, in many ways because um, obviously it changed forever our idea of literacy, it changed forever the idea of ownership of knowledge and so on. And the question is, what disruptive technology do we see in universities today? And here's an answer, a question, a cute clue for you, really. Um, shout out the answer, you know it. Mobile devices. Mobile, mobile devices, exactly. Things like phones, iPads, I, I, tabs, and so on. This is the first mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's his and hers, isn't it? We need to, don't need to converse. But uh, no, actually, the first mobile phone was, was Malcolm Cooper's design, the brick, mainly battery. <laughs> And it was an interesting device because it suddenly untethered us and took us out into the world, places that we could never be before and still have conversations. And um, I think Richard Clark's question about whether technology was neutral or not um, was, was a big one. Um, is the internet inherently evil, for instance, is a nice question. Well, well, no, it's neutral. What you put into it can be evil or good. And, and these are all kind of little concepts and questions that keep flying around in these debates. Um, Marshall McLuhan actually nailed it when he said that we shape our tools and then afterwards, afterwards they shape us. And the question for us all here today is, is, as educators, how are we allowing the tools to shape us, to shape our practice? I think that's another important thing. I, I told you I'd throw a lot at you today, um, rushing through these. Let's talk about communities, um, these emerging communities, things that are, are happening that, that are defining the way people coalesce together and work together and collaborate and then separate and so on. Um, picture taken on the tube recently, five generations of mobile device, from the book on the right hand side right the way through to the laptop, and everything in between, Kindles, iPod touches, the whole thing, it's all there. And uh, Mark Curtis, who in his book um, Distraction in 2005, he said this, we're becoming distributed beings, and I think that's important for distance educators, like yourselves and like me. We are distributed beings now. We are, we are getting used to the idea that location isn't important anymore. Connection is important now. That's the difference. That's what we've got to consider, I think. And we can have membership of several tribes. 
Pierre Bourdieu came up with the idea of cultural capital. Well, now we have digital cultural capital as well, the idea that um, you can actually identify with people through the tools and the technologies you use. In effect, they're digital totems. The tribes gather around these digital totems, they tell stories, they celebrate, they identify with each other. And that, for me, is, 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 is that the way I see communities developing and emerging in this online world that we live in. The idea that all of these things happen, you can share rituals and rules, you can, you can develop customs and, or, or, or reflect on the customs <coughs> that, that you share, the social mores that um, we all agree with, or, or try to agree with. Tribal identity, I think, is equally important. So, for instance, you could, you could compare two tribes, which you can be members of both of at the same time, the Flickerite tribe and the Facebooker tribe. Facebook is very, very kind of trivial, and they're very flippant and very kind of frivolous in what they do. They throw food at each other, and they share um, images. But the Flickerites share images as well, but they're much more serious about the way they share their images, because for them, the images become much more of a totem for them to identify with and to, and to discuss. Flickerites tend not to use their own persona or avatar. They tend to have a picture of something else to identify themselves with, and maybe they don't even use their own name either. Whereas Facebookers are readily identified as who they are. And as I say, you can switch between the two tribes, but you will be behaving differently in each totem. And then we've got the Wikipedian tribe, probably one of the largest tribes on the planet, after the Facebooker tribe. They practice all these things. There's a nice backronym for um, for, for Wiki, now. what I know is, it's where you share your knowledge. It's that kind of tribe, the tribe of knowledge, and this is how I'm going to develop my knowledge by sharing with everybody else. And there's a lot of deletionism that goes on, and exclusionism, and a lot of inclusionism as well. And that's the way we see it happening. I'll come back to Wikipedia later on. Um, what's this a picture of? Tell me if you recognise it. It's Obama, and he's in in Germany, yeah, Berlin. This is, 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 is by, it's been Ein Berliner moment, I suppose. Really. It was before he was president, but he was on course to becoming the first black president of the US. History was being made. And can you see what people in the back are doing, in the background? They're all, yeah, I'll, I'll look it up for you. They're all <laughs> holding up cameras and devices to capture the moment because they want to share it with someone who's not there who they care about. This is connection. There's even a guy out there on the left holding a laptop up. He's live streaming, you know? He's holding his laptop up. And um, the world's press were there, but these people were also there, and they wanted to say, look, I'm here now, I want to share this with you. This is the kind of tribal practice we see going on there in the world. This is the way communities are, um, are connecting with each other through devices. So the future of technology, the future of the community. Back in 1990, we thought it would be multimedia, and of course that was true. But 2000, 1999, somewhere around there, we probably were realizing that everything was going to kind of, um, kind of converge on the web, and that's near enough what happened. What we're saying now, 10 years on, is probably the future is going to be smart mobile. That's going to be the future of distance education, I think. I may be wrong, but um, I think smart mobile technologies are going to open up a whole new realm of distance education for us. Because, as you can see on the screen, smart technologies will take the classroom back out into the world again. And that, I think, is a trend that we have to acknowledge. If I show you this axis here, this is something I've been working on with several other people, including Nova Spivak and people like um, uh, Stephen Downs and, and um, George Siemens, and we've been having great debates over this. What's going to be the look of the web in the future. Well, if you look at these X and Y axes here, you see the information connectivity one side, social connectivity the other. And if we look at the way we want to go, that's the trajectory, I think. We want to have information and social richness. That's going to be desirable. But how do we get there? Well, web one is quite low. If you call it web one, whatever that is, Tim O'Reilly kind of said when he introduced the idea of web 2.0, but it didn't really mean much other than people were starting to use the web in different ways. So Web 1, the Web, or whatever it was, was quite low on both those scales. And Web 2, which I suppose emerged in popularity around about six, eight years ago maximum, um, when blogs and wikis started to become known and so on, that was much more rich in social connectivity, but it was very low still in terms of information. If we start looking at the semantic web, which is machine-driven and, and intelligence-based, it's much more information-led, but not so socially rich. What we need to look at is what we're starting to call Web X.0. So to summarise, Web 1 is really about connecting information. 
Web 2 is about connecting people. Web 3 is about connecting knowledge. And Web 4 is really about connecting all that combined intelligence. And a lot of these are kind of moving towards that way together. So it's not as strict as you can see. That This is where the dotted lines are there, I think, to show you that there's some kind of latitude of interpretation here. But that's what we think the map of the future is going to look like. And again, you can um, debate this. Um, but already we're seeing that kind of intelligence built into the web. Uh, this is Andy Clark's idea of the snail trail, the idea that the first snail that finds food leaves a big slimy enzyme trail and it expends a lot of energy to get there. The second snail that moves along that trail expends less energy until by the time snail 20 is going along, there's no energy expended whatsoever. And if we can make that happen in education so that people can find things easier um, without spending too much time on, time on them, that's, that's got to be a good thing in some ways. Um, recommend a system. You, you go onto Amazon and you buy a book and then Amazon says to you, oh, did you know that 26 people have bought this book, also bought that book? You go, ooh. I didn't know that book existed. And suddenly you buy a book that you didn't even know existed two minutes ago. That's the kind of tools we're talking about. This is the kind of stuff that I'm expecting that we're going to see entering into the domain very shortly. Um, and then there's the wearable systems, like this Google Glass system, the idea of enhanced vision, the idea of being able to track your life if you want to, being able to um, play back parts of it so that you can remember things that occurred to you when you were halfway down the high street. Let's talk about theories as well. This is um, something I picked up from uh, McRae on his website, Lonerosity, a couple of days ago. The idea of technological pedagogical symbiosis, which is a big mouthful, but the idea is that in the centre, where they overlap, all the good stuff happens. Is this transformational? What McRae is arguing is that technology has never been, been really that transformational in terms of education, because all we do with it is we go back and we revert to the old practices. So when the interactive whiteboard first came into the classroom, what did we use it for? We used it to project slides and we used it to write on. Just like we did with normal blackboard and projection screens, when in fact there was so much more that we could do with it. And what we have to do is start looking at the affordances of these technologies, to start thinking, okay, what is it possible to do with this that we haven't done already? There's the transformational element, and I think he's right we have to look at how the two feed off each other, how pedagogy is shaped by technology and how te technology shaped, uh, is shaped by pedagogy. And uh, that's, that's a tall order, but I think it's, um, it's a point in the right direction. Oh, there's the man um, that Diana and Laura and I talked about this morning, the, the, the um, good-looking dude walking around the stage with his designer jeans on. Um, the Khan Academy and flipping the classroom and Ted and all these ideas um, how, how important are they going to be for the future? Well, I agree with a lot of what Diana and Laura said this morning about things like MOOCs. Um, one thing I will say about the classroom, flipping the classroom, I'm sure you've heard of this, the idea that you offset a lot of activities for students to do away from the classroom. Um, my argument is that that's not new, and we've been doing that for years with things like homework. What is new is if we flip the roles and we start asking the students to become teachers, and as lecturers, we become learners and get them to teach us. And so this is what I practice in Plymouth with my team. Um, we actually um, learn by teaching, obviously. Descendant dissimus, I think, is the old Latin expression. Um, we practice what we call bare pedagogy, where we get the students to go off and create stuff, solve problems, meet challenges, and then come back into the classroom, present it in front of a critical audience, which includes myself and the rest of the students. And we are, we are given license to argue with each other, challenge each other, and debate so that they learn the business of critical thinking, reflective practice, and defending arguments, making arguments. Um, another theory, which is Moore's theory, which I'm sure you're familiar with, this idea of transactional distance, Michael Moore's theory, um, is the idea that dialogue and structure, in, in any distance context, are actually kind of diametrically opposed to each other. They're, sy they're symbiotic, but they're also opposed to each other. So, that the transactional distance, this idea of the psychological separation between the teacher and the student, becomes smaller if, 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 um, if dialogue is weightier, um, and becomes wider if structure becomes too weighty. An example of that might be a television program, very highly structured, very little dialogue that goes on in it, but if you suddenly make it into a phone-in, suddenly the structure goes out the window and the dialogue takes centre stage. And from my own research, when I was doing my thesis back, well, ten years ago now, I suppose, what I, I discovered was that certain technologies amplify the distance if they're used wrongly. 
rather than reduce the distance. Email, for instance, if used wrongly, actually causes a greater separation between the teacher and the student psychologically than does something like um, I think the telephone. Maybe there's a synchronous, asynchronous element there going on. I never got that far in the research because I had to submit my thesis, but it's an interesting idea, isn't it? And then the idea of different interaction characteristics and the tools that go with them. These three kind of ideas here, the cognition, the thinking, communication and cooperation, these are three basic human characteristics that we all encounter every day. And there are tools that you could say actually fit those needs. So for me, thinking, how am I going to know how my, what my thoughts are, if they're quite abstract, until I put them down somewhere and share them, and then I communicate through a social network like Twitter, and then perhaps um, I cooperate with some colleagues on a wiki. And, and that way I'm using the tools to support my cognitive processes. John C. D. Brown talks about peer-based learning, which is another thing we're seeing happening. And indeed, there's this relatively new theory called paradoxy, which I'm sure some of you have heard of, the idea that people are teaching each other now. Um, it's not just the lecture of the stage or the slave <laughs> the sage on the stage anymore. It's now each person becoming a, a sage in their own right. Every student having a certain body, body of knowledge which they can share with each other, and they tend to share that in a, in a kind of a peer-related way now. Another theory, the idea of connectivism. This is Siemens and Downs theory, that learning occurs outside of us as well as inside us, and it's not so much what we know now that's important, but where we can find it when we need that knowledge. And that's why connection is so important these days. Um, this idea of making connections, I've already said this. I'll share these slides later on with you so that you can read these in more detail. But it's about using our friends as surrogates for our knowledge as well. Connecting into very powerful pro uh, professional learning networks to give us that kind of link into the knowledge exactly when we need it, at the point we need it. And um, I store my knowledge with my friends, says Karen Stevens, which I think is a fabulous quote. Deleuze and Guattari, I'm sure you've um, read some of you about the idea of rhizomes, the idea that chaos can become emergent in different ways and that there are no boundaries and no centres to these kind of root structures. You pull up a weed in the garden and five minutes later it comes up somewhere else. You can never really get rid of the blighters because there's a massive root structure underneath. And this is very similar to the anarchy we see on the web, this kind of chaotic web that, that is emerging in front of us as we speak. Um, but there is a way of harnessing this, I think. The idea that um, you, can, you can create links which are meaningful to you, which are personal to you, and those links cross over with other people's links, and occasionally you can link with them as well, but generally speaking, you're playing your own furrow in this chaotic web that we, we, we create for ourselves. Um, some more thought thinking on this, the idea of spreading on its own, uh, almost as if it's got a mind of its own, I suppose. And the most important thing about rhizomatic learning is that knowledge can be negotiated between people. What some people in some communities may think is, is knowledge may not be construed as knowledge by other people. So therefore, um, each community will create its own folksonomies. The idea that we can create the stuff that's meaningful to us. And in effect, anything can be counted as knowledge if you're interested in it and there's enough other people that agree with you on it. So we are now looking at challenges to the curriculum. We are now looking at possibly community becoming the curriculum. And the community deciding what the curriculum is going to be. This is why I think that in some ways things like MOOCs, and even Coursera to some degree, the, these um, massively open online programs that we're starting to see happening now, could actually become quite important for defining the future of communities, and the future of knowledge and what it means to us. So finally our students. Well, I'm noticing, as Patricia Carnwell did in 2000, that academic support is, has always been the traditional domain of the tutor, but now the other two are generally being um, looked after by students. Whenever I run an online course, students technically, technically support each other and emotionally support each other before I can even get there. In fact, I don't, I don't even have to bother about that anymore because they will take care of that themselves. So this is back to the pedagogy idea of peer support. I think we're seeing happening. And then there's this idea of all these um, terms here, the net generation, Tapscott and Williams. Digital natives, Mark Prensky, um, millennials, Diana Oblinger, and so on. Homozapians, Wim Veen, 
Ben Bracken. All of these ideas that somehow young people are, are different in their way of learning than we are. Um, they multitask better, they live at twitch speed, and they have a natural affinity to technology. I have to say that although there is anecdotal evidence of this, there's no firm empirical evidence. And several recent studies have come out showing that, in effect, this age group, which is in this case a 70 to 23 year old age group, a study with just over 2,000 students in it, most of them are still basic users. Because when it comes to things like games, they're great at using them. When it comes to things like learning seriously, they still struggle and there's still a problem. Um, so we have to kind of ask the question, it's not about age perhaps anymore, it's now about the use of the technology. My, my father, who's 85, 84, sorry, he um, got onto Facebook last year. He said to me, you know, what's, what's all this Facebook thing about? And I said, well, you know, you can connect with people you've, never, you know, you've not met for years. You can connect with your cousin or your, your niece in, in New Zealand who you haven't seen for 30 years. He said, well, I'll go about it. He said, and so we got onto it and started friending people. And my 17-year-old my, um, daughter, not the one who's getting married, the other one, 17-year-old daughter, I've got three kids that I know of, um, but... Um, <laughs> The, the second uh, daughter, 17 year old, she said uh, on Facebook, WTF, granddad's on Facebook. <laughs> and of course, then she realized her error because he came back to her and said, What does WTF mean? <laughs> and so, quick as a flash, she kept, Welcome to Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's my girl, you know, thinking on her feet. Um, but you see, um, there is a language differential because the problem is he now uses WTF with all his friends. <laughs> It's a bit dodgy, isn't it? You know, you, you, you know, you, I, I have a hard to tell him, you know, what really sounds like. But um, there is this differential. I think we've got to be careful when we make these assumptions about age groups. But um, I think David White's idea of digital residence and visitors is much more appropriate because it looks at how we are habituated to these technologies rather than our age group or when we were born. Um, and a few final thoughts. Um, Henry Jenkins says, uh, in hunting culture, kids play with bows and arrows. In this society, they play with information. Here's a few examples of this. Viral videos, I'm sure you recognize these. These are totems that younger people, and sometimes older people, gather around. 25 million views to date on just one channel for the Star Wars kid. The Numa Numa song, much more than that, 46 million. 51 million for the thriller, penitentiary dance, and Charlie Bet Me, 447 million. People have got too much time on that, I don't know, these days, but this is the kind of totems that we're seeing communities coalescing around. So it must have some kind of meaning to them. This has to have some kind of message to us as serious educators, doesn't it? If I show my students this picture, the younger ones, they may not know what this is. You'll probably know what this is. If I show them that, they say, oh, it's a 60s reggae band. <laughs> Lee Harvey and the way though, yeah. He did not jam alone. So there's a political message in this girl. You see, Photoshop covers a whole majority of sins, doesn't it, really? It's easy to do. It's easy to mislead. So, in effect, students need kind of digital wisdom. I show them this picture, I say, what's wrong with it? And they go, oh. is it 70%? You know? yeah. And eventually they get what I'm trying to say, that you know, not all web pages are trustworthy. And, and um, I'll show you a quote from Socrates. Uh, sorry, I'm so embarrassed, I just realised what's happened here. My son was asked to find a picture of Socrates. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to have to change this a minute. Press the escape button here. Anyway, it was Plato that said it. And, and uh, I'll find a picture of Plato for you. Here we go. Damn it, that's Socrates! <laughs> right, hang on, hang on. That's correct now. now. Now we're correct. Okay. What you've just witnessed is what we would call Darwinianism, the survival of the fittest content. <laughs> which is exactly what's happening on the, the Wikipedia pages now. Down at the bottom you're seeing, after all of the kind of deletionism and exclusionism going on, you're seeing down at the bottom a crowdsourced kind of um, evaluation where you tick to show how choiceworthy you think it is, five, five stars, how objective it is, how complete it is, how well written it is. And then maybe if you're knowledgeable about the subject, you click that box as well. And it all goes into a back-end database, crunches up, and the editors can see how, how uh, effective or how correct that page is. Now, it's not fail-safe, but it's the nearest thing I think we can find to improving the content on the web. So, in effect, all of this stuff that's going on, MOOCs included, we're going to see a lot of this stuff happening. I'm not going to dwell on MOOCs too much, but 
Here's a final quote for you from Kevin Kelly, which I think really sums it all up. How can technology make a person better? Only in this way, by providing each person with the chances. We've been debating all day about things like the ethical issues behind e-learning and distance education and so on. Ultimately, I think we're all in this together and we're, we're in a period of rapid change where it's very difficult to keep up with technologies and keep up with the way communities are, are, are emerging and then dying back and so on. It's a very volatile area that we're in. But um, I think there are lots of green shoots coming through, lots of promise for the future. This has been rather an eclectic tour through some of my thinking at the moment. If you want to catch up with it, then look at my blog, which is um, there. It's all on the wall. And uh, I'll leave it at that. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
identify our similarities and commonalities than our differences. Does that make um, answer your question? There's a nod in the head, I would say. <laughs> Stephen. Thanks, Steve, for the mindstorm. That was brilliant. <laughs> um, I just wanted to tie together a couple of things you said. On the one hand, you were suggesting, um, well, you, you were quoting McLuhan saying that the, you know, we shape our tools and then they shape us. And then you went on to say that, that the web is neutral. And, and, and those two didn't seem to sit very comfortably yeah. together. And, and I was wondering if it's, is the web really neutral if it's shaping us? For example, Nicholas Carl suggests that um, it's, it's affecting the way that we process information neuronally. Well, yeah, Nicholas Carl says that, Tara Brabazon says that, you know, Andrew Keane, Larry Sanger, there's plenty of naysayers out there who, who say that it, it, um, it, it is, it, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing in, in, in effect. Um, I, I didn't actually agree, agree with uh, Richard Clark. I, I'm more on the side of Robert Cosmo, who was his opponent in the 86 debate. Who actually said that no technology is not neutral? It's, it's, it's actually got affordances to it. So I, I subscribe more to JJ Gibson's idea of the the, the bottom-up approach to, to perception of, of, of these tools, in as much that you can actually perceive that they will do certain things for you. At one level, I think it is neutral. At the level of it being a content repository, I think it is neutral. But then when you get down to the the nuances of how to use it, and how to interact with it, and how to uh, scale it, and so on, then I think what you've got is a very um, interpretable tool, and we all interpret it differently. So I think McLuhan's right that we, the, the tools do shape our behaviour. The first thing I do when I when I get onto my web page usually is is check to see how many hits there are, because <laughs> I want, and, and how many comments there are, because that's the first thing that I'm interested in. Um, other people may do other things when they go on. They may check the email first. Um, so it shapes our behaviour in as much that although it's neutral at one level, I, I think it's very rich in nuances at another level. So that sounds like hedging your bets, but I think we have to look at it on several levels. I think I have to think about that, but thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any further questions for Steve? Yes, there's one right. right here. I see that hand. Come forward for prayer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really liked your diagram uh, between debate and structure. And what we see, according to my opinion, is we're seeing a centralization in terms of uh, hardware structures, and by this I mean data centers. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we have an openness of debate and discussion in terms of web content and wikis and everything. Do you think that maybe the centralization of a few data centers in terms of hardware might harm in the future this openness we, we are aiming uh, in terms of web content and debate and discourse and discussion? Or is just a better way to have higher efficiency, and it will help it. Um, I, I think you're alluding here to learning management systems in closed virtual learning environments, aren't you? Is that correct? No, I mean in the general world of web, you know, data centers. Yeah. I mean, Google oh, yeah. large data centers, right, okay. right, like the hardware right. of the internet, the cables. Yeah. I see what you mean now. Yeah. Um, now the interesting thing here is that it's a volatile situation, as I, as I said at the end. Um, it's very dynamic, things change all the time. Um, crowds and communities tend to migrate from one thing to another. I mean, whatever happened to Friendster? Yeah, I mean, just a case in point, whatever happened to, um, I'm trying to think of some other ones that, that died the death. Um, MySpace is, you know, is trying to relaunch itself, but there's been a migration from there to where your friends are. And I think where your friends are, where the people who are important to you are, is more important than the content in many ways. The context to me is now king. Content is not king anymore. So the places that are these bastions of kind of closedness, whether it's a data center or whether it's um, a closed journal, that only allows its subscribers to see it. I think their days are numbered in many ways because the community will decide what's important to them and the community will want openness. They will want to be able to find places where they can get together to share ideas and to, to do all this kind of tribal stuff um, without any constraints. So Google, fine, you know, okay, I noticed it lost a lot of money this morning on its shares, or yesterday, was it? Um, I wonder how long these, um, these totems will last before other totems come up out of the ground and, and, and take our attention away from them. 
So Facebook, Google, the, the, the giants, uh, I wonder how long they will last. Start next one. <laughs> Do we have any further questions? Oh, almost. One, one last question. I'm afraid this is extraordinarily naive. I'm teaching a distance course at the moment. If I'm still doing it in, say, three years' time, which my employer probably won't want me to be, how will I be doing it differently? I don't know. <laughs> What's your I don't know what. I, uh, I suppose it, it's um, it's not a naive question. I think it's a question we all have to ask. You know, what will we be doing in a few years' time that's different to what we're doing now? Um, I know that it will be different to what we're doing now because there will be new tools that we'll use in three years' time, which we're not using right now. Um, five years ago, I, I would hardly have considered a touchscreen tablet with natural gestures on it, which I now use regularly in my classroom. I can connect my, my iPad up to my interactive whiteboard. And the students go, how do you do that? You know? And these are all supposed to be digital natives, you know? Yeah? So we can do some things now which we didn't do five years ago. I don't know what the technologies are. And they're coming in three years' time. Um, we can't really predict the future, all we can do is imagine it. If we are looking at new tools, we're probably looking at something which is non-touch. Maybe in a few years' time your grandchildren will sit on your lap and say, Granddad, did, it really, did you really have to touch a computer to make it work? You know, this is the kind of stuff we're looking at in the future of, you know, non-touch technologies perhaps. Certainly wearable technologies. Maybe these are things that you'll be using within your delivery of your new courses. I don't we can't. We can speculate, but we can't be sure. It'll be different, whatever it is. Can I thank you again, Steve, for being with us to the last second? Before we thank you, Steve. Well, once again, Steve, thank you very much for that.